Hi, uh, my name is Terry Allen from the Cuyahoga County Health Department in uh, the greater Cleveland area and a member of the population health round table. This question, it's uh, following up on Dr. Kalik's mention of the P word, politics word. And so uh, interesting uh, stories from both Detroit and West Virginia. I know Dr. Gupta's experience in Charleston with the chemical spill and the swirl of, of politics that occurred around that. Uh, and uh, certainly the in the wake of the Flint um, situation. I wondered if you could share with us lessons in, in, in the wake of both of those uh, situations, what you've learned, what you've taken forward, and how to interact uh, the pressures that may come from the community and from from uh, what, whether it's to reopen a school or it's to uh, to provide access to a water supply. What you what advice you would provide uh, in in dealing in the in the middle of the tempest for for those that uh, will have to face that change. Absolutely. Uh, so I think. One lesson that we've learned um, in, in Michigan, certainly, is, is that it's really, uh, one thing I've learned in the work I'm doing is to really listen to people's concerns, um, because they have a valid reason to have mistrust of, of government. Uh, one thing I've tried to always focus on is, is the facts and the science and the truth. Um, but also be respectful, very respectful of the community. Uh, there are some folks who uh, you know, have, have concerns about Detroit's water supply, uh, or they, they make a lot of, uh, they, they, they draw a lot of similarities between Flint and Detroit when it comes to lead. Uh, and those are two very different circumstances. Uh, when it comes to lead in the city of Detroit, it's really about old housing stock. Uh, and if Flint had stayed with Detroit's water, they probably wouldn't have the, the issue that they had. Uh, so without getting myself in any more trouble, um, I can say just really validating the community, uh, but also in, in my role, uh, it's about really uh, providing the, the data and the science uh, and the resources uh, for the community as well. So, uh, so the water crisis that, thank you Terry for bringing it up, uh, Terry is referring to was the situation in 2014 where a chemical contamination led to denying the wa drinking water to 300,000 people across nine counties in West Virginia. Two lessons really. One, um, I think Ron Manuel is attributed to this, is never let crisis go to waste. Um, we enacted some of the most um, progressive uh, water protection laws in the country as a result of that particular event. And second, for my practice colleagues, um, you, you will probably, um, if, if it's meaningful work, you'll come very close to losing your job. So do not let that be in the way of um, doing the right thing for, uh, and have a long view and do the right thing for the majority of the public that you're trying to serve at the end of the day, regardless of the consequences. Thanks for the panel presentation. My name is Lee Yang. Uh, I, I think the more you try to change, the more it stays the same. I always heard people say that this. I don't know why we have so much civilization, so much high tech, and how come our well-being is some sort of getting backward. So I think if, as a researcher, and I think you all do, and as a policy maker, I think we want to know what do you do to see whether it really change, and the change is positive and effective and improve people's well-being. Now, so I want to know what mechanism that you have try to see accountability of the data set and accountability of the researchers or your staff. And second is uh, how kind of budget you want to use, and I don't mean just you individual budget or a specific project. I mean you have to think about a big uh, government budget. I don't want you to just say the government can print the money, so as long as you get money, that would be good. I don't think so, because the budget is for everybody, for taxpayer basically. And if you don't use it right, you have better don't tax the people's money. So I just wonder if you can examine your situation, your project, whether that's effective, whether that's don't even waste people's right. money, and then everything will be fine. You will see people happy. Those are great questions, and they really get to accountability and knowing whether what you're doing is working uh, and is well, worth the value. What I want to say is it's not just the, the, the data you get in. You want to 
she to, to find whether the data is correct. Another social program is not working. People, recipients, they don't really receive it. And the students, they pay the, the lunch, but they don't have the lunch. And so they get the money, they say they want to serve the, the lunch again. So how many times the money that you need to search one time of, of lunch? The same as Medicare, Medicaid, and the social program, employment program. A lot of people don't get a yep. Th Thank you. I want to give them a chance to answer. Thank you for your yes, question. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. I think one of the issues that you're, you're getting at is, for me, I think it's the issue of silos. There are silos and there is competition um, in many things, but including public health. Uh, often, you know, you'll have a city, and I'm not just talking about Detroit, there's, there's many other cities across the country where you've got different hospital systems competing for the same grant, competing for uh, the same patients. I think often when we're evaluating things, we're evaluating our little bucket, but no one really knows, are we serving the, the patients with the highest need? Are we all just missing that 5% of folks who need our services and no one's actually touching them? So I think we really have to think about aligning programs, understanding where the gaps are, sharing data across health systems with public health. Uh, I think that will get to, I think, that accountability and us really being able to see an impact. That's a good agenda for population health right there, too. Okay, go ahead. I, I would just, it'll, it, it, this is an opportunity to give a plug that we're finally now um, having an extensive data set for Medicaid. We've been able to do lots of studies and outcomes on Medicare, but we haven't been able to on Medicaid because every state was collecting it differently, and we now have um, a state, uh, we have a, a data set that all states are collecting information the same way and um, delivering it in the same format with thousands of um, items in the data set that we'll be able to now look across states and be able to compare and, and, and understand what states are doing. There's also the opportunity there, once that gets up and running, to then link the data, I think, um, to link the data with other services that are happening. So we're not going to have all of these individual data elements for individuals we'll be able to look. And there's been some interesting um, places where we're linking it with school data or linking Medicaid data with, uh, with WIC or uh, with Early Head Start. And so by, by being able to do that and look across to, to see when an intervention in one silo has an effect in a second silo, um, being able to understand uh, how those implications are and, and how the, the back and forth is going in each of those uh, different um, areas of healthcare. So this is a, I won't repeat, this is a topic for a larger discussion, but I, I think um, understanding as we're trying to make all these efforts that there is that medical industrial complex and, and that, that big picture needs to be fed. And throughout the Great Recession, that's the area that has continued to do well. It's doing very well in West Virginia as well. Um, so that's the issue. But to a larger issue of social determinants, I think we have to make a case. Um, you know, the idea of neonatal abstinence syndrome, I'll go back as an example of opioids. Um, it's, it's, I guess, okay if we're looking at giving um, uh, you know, Medicaid um, uh, state plan amendment to allow uh, moms and babies' diet to be taken care of. But we have to be thinking upstream. We've got to be thinking how do we prevent these because 1% of births in the country is about 40,000 kids, uh, 40,000 babies. And we've estimated in West Virginia it cost about a million dollars per child. That's about $40 billion of uh, incurred liability year per year per year without knowing the long-term consequences. So we've got to, it's an entirely preventable issue, and we've got to look at upstream issues in addressing these things. And I think these, these things are not partisan issues. These are, these are public health, but they are apolitical issues. We've got to be able to address those, not just downstream, but actually more effortfully upstream. whose job it is to, to bring the solution. There's a workforce in America called public health practitioners, and, and, and you're some of the best examples. And I love hearing that, that you're doing a convening practice, whether you're listening and involving community stakeholders, you're practicing public health 3.0. But we know your budgets are small in, in health departments. Public health is maybe 1% of the US health budget. But here at CMS, we're spending so much on the medicalized approaches. You know, we know the future is going to be some version of, of prospective payment and um, changing the health system so that hospitals and providers are paid to keep people healthy. The problem here in Maryland, where we have that payment system, 
is that the providers um, don't realize that there's a public health profession. They don't realize there are convening strategies. We're not reaching out as a public health profession. They're not coming to us thinking there are solutions. They're going to the public health management consultants for cost control, find the frequent flyers. So this bright future where the money is in America, we're spending the money, but even if we change the payment system to our providers, they're not going to reach out to the best of the public health practice. And maybe in Detroit, maybe in West Virginia, maybe in CMS, you're seeing mechanisms to say to the providers, don't do it your way. There's a profession that knows how to do it. Uh, and not all public health commissioners know how to do it, frankly. The profession is a little bit stuck in the 50s in a lot of places. So how do we make the profession better, and how do we pay it to do its job? I, I mean, I'll start. Um, to give you an example, uh, there's 19,000 inmates in, in West Virginia today that have substance use disorder. Um, at the door, uh, public options stop. So the, the, across the country, uh, incarcerated populations, about 5,000 prisons, only 150 offer some type of treatment for SUD, um, but it's a state liability issue. And, and that's a big issue. So uh, we're, we're talking about these things, but we're also talking about um, where public health can go, but individual practitioners is going to be very difficult to take a medicalized approach. Uh, I'm looking at this as, a, as, a, as specific to opioid as a, the largest population sitting a, a captivated audience, um, pardon the pun, uh, that we're not able to give treatment uh, to and provide vocational and education and all those things that they can when they're on um, re-entry and release, they can be uh, productive partners and help the socioeconomic development of those communities. Um, those are, again, missed opportunities that um, are challenging, yet um, forget about changing the entire system. We have a particular subsection of the system that not only do we not um, incentivize, but actually we effectively de-incentivize from a federal standpoint. Uh, and, and we are losing these people. What we found was 56 percent of these individuals died of an overdose within 30 days of release from, from an overdose drug. So that's the unfortunate uh, situation. I think we have to be bold and insert ourselves into the equation and be able to really sell our value. Again, speaking to being able to speak other stakeholders' language. Um, an example I'll give, there is a hepatitis A outbreak. It's, it's gone national now, but Michigan, uh, Southeast Michigan in particular, has been uh, dealing with a hepatitis A outbreak, the largest one in the country for the past couple of years. And so what I did was go to my emergency departments, all of them, brought them all together, because I am an ER doctor. I think that might be why they came to the table, but whatever you got to do. Um, and so I said, look, there's an outbreak. We know so many of our most vulnerable people who are most at risk for hepatitis A, substance use disorders, uh, struggling with uh, homelessness issues. We know they're coming through the emergency department. We want you to start vac screening and vaccinating people in the emergency department. Uh, a lot of my colleagues, which they often do, similar when I was in Baltimore, they looked at me like I had two heads and said, whatever, go to your public health world. But I said, look, we can provide support. We'll help you get your, your refrigerator. We'll help you get your vaccines. We'll make it as simple as possible. And now we've got all the emergency departments in Detroit uh, actually screening and vaccinating for hepatitis A. So I think we have to, again, just insert ourselves, show our value, and then bring everyone else along as well. I think it's a great question because I think you can pick up two strains of how people think about how public health and population health should assert itself. One strain is to figure out the language, to be able to find common ground, to work together. These are not mutually exclusive. But the other one is really about power and the ability to um, use regulation, authority, orders of the health commissioner, but more generally political power to actually accomplish the goals that you want. And you know, some people would look at a lot of the struggles that we saw this morning and say, these are questions of political power as much as they are questions of can we get people to see the same you know, um, issue. So it's, I don't think it's one or the other, but I think, just to point out, I think we're, we're picking up uh, both of those. And I think public health has power. Um, and uh, you know, these particular people are, have not been afraid to use it. I'm sure, you know, uh, Dr. Khaldun, that when you were having those conversations, people are aware that you're, you're the commissioner of health. This is an outbreak. You know, you're, you're speaking not just as an ER doctor who's showing up with an idea. You have uh, authority. In, in, in Baltimore, for example, the health commissioner set up standards for 
responding to the opioid crisis that they're expecting the um, hospitals to meet. So th there is probably uh, an interesting role in thinking about uh, power, not just about um, ways of uh, finding agreement. Next question. Hi, my name is Joni Nelson, and I'm from the College of Dental Medicine at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. So we do a lot of work um, around oral health research, education, and policy, um, working in our rural health communities. So my question to the panel um, is specifically around getting your perspectives on how to strategize, how to address rural health disparities in a very specific way on whether certain policies may or may not hinder rural health outcomes for some of our communities. I don't know if you could speak to that in Great. a very generic way. I think that's paging Dr. Gupta, perhaps, from <laughs> West Virginia there for that, that question, rural health disparities. Yeah, so for, for the oral health, first of all, before I go oh, to Oh, did you say health. oral and rural? Both. I said generically rural health, but yeah. I'm, we're like a pack of zebras and horses. We do sure. public health, but we're in a college of dental medicine. So okay, we got do it. oral health um, disparities. Rural health, okay. Um, you know, one of the challenges we have uh, across the country is we don't even have broadband access in all communities. And we, I still have physicians who are using the fax machine to get health alert network advisories in West Virginia. Um, so I, I think one of the problems, which is not just primarily a public health problem, but it is a public health problem, which is we've got to make sure that there's this sort of the access problem gets resolved and we all have to be engaged and, and that's another research space that we have to be looking at because we're talking about telehealth, telemedicine, especially with um, mental health issues as well as the substance use disorder issues. And we cannot get, I think, we've got to adapt innovation, uh, innovate and adapt uh, the technology that is available today. And part of that involves having, again, just like we built roads, um, it's time to build and make sure that everyone has access to high-speed internet in, in order to have that. Um, to me, that's the number one most important issue. Now, from a, from a rural health perspective, we've done a lot of um, both the, the version, West Virginia version, the hub and spoke model, for example, in substance use disorder, uh, but also expand other programs to make sure that those populations are really not, um, you know, that's another disparity and, and that leads to inequity by itself. And I think that's one, especially in Appalachia, that often gets forgotten and, and, and we continue to work both from um, understanding those communities. I mean, I wanna, there's areas within West Virginia, rural areas, that don't still have clean drinking water. I just, you know, so th th there are, these are challenges and I, we could go back as to what the causes, root causes are, but um, whether it's the ability to maintain small water systems and, and have them run or others, but there are, continues to be a challenge and I think part of it we start with technologically advancing our rural areas and frontier areas um, to bring it to the 21st century. Either of you want to add? I could just add that, and I spoke about this earlier, Detroit is geographically very large and doesn't have a robust transportation system. So in many ways, uh, how we're approaching public health in Detroit is, I think, more rural in the sense that we are bringing services into the community. Um, and, it's, and it's a change in, in, in the way that I'm having my public health workforce at the health department actually think about the services they provide. We don't want someone to have to get on a bus, three buses in three hours, and take off their whole day from work to come to the health department. So mobile strategies based in neighborhoods and meeting people where they are, uh, I think absolutely aligns with some of the rural work as well. I would just add that we now have a rural health strategy at CMS trying to figure out how when we talk about any issue, what's the difference when you need to go into these frontier areas. Um, at CMS, we have a, um, a learning collaborative of rural states talking to each other, so sharing some of the best practices since they're unique to each other. And as a convener, that's one of the things that we can do is help them figure out how to maximize some of what they're doing um, that they may not have thought about. And I guess last, we're also thinking and have worked with um, some of the folks here about what kinds of payment models we can look at that might be unique and different for some of the rural hospitals. Uh, we've got a, um, a model in Pennsylvania looking at some ways of figuring out how to make these rural hospitals that are uh, struggling with volume and expertise and how we can figure out how to help them transition into some of these new more value-based purchasing areas. Yeah, and just, just to point on that, you know, uh, when 
the payment model shifts, some rural hospitals say, you know, we go from trying to figure out how to keep the beds filled, you know, convincing sick patients to come in, to trying to figure out how to keep the beds empty through different kinds of prevention-oriented initiatives. So I think payment can play an important role, I think. I think that there's sort of a, a bigger level of engagement with the healthcare system that's coming out of all the comments here. Dr. Magnus. Thank you. Um, Sandy Magnin. So you talked um, earlier about finding common ground to actually get our payment system changed. And I loved how you laid out the three truths, uh, Ellen Marie, about uh, what people finally bipartisan agreement to pass MACRA. So how will we find common ground to invest in our children? So we heard Eileen Crimmins, we heard Dave Williams just talk about the need to really be investing early and a great deal in our children. How would the panel see how we could build common ground around policies and investment for our very young children? So it's a, as a pediatric clinician, um, thank you for the question, first of all, and thank you for your role in all of this. It's one of those areas where I think we have common ground, right? I think no one would, it's apple pie and motherhood, and no one would disagree. The problem is they are not expensive. We've heard folks talk about kids almost as budget dust. So when you're trying to figure out where to invest, there's not a lot of savings down the line. And the way we have organized health systems now, they are looking quarter to quarter for improvement, or even a two or three year period, and lots of these investments are obviously so much longer. I think part is we have to figure out how to change the discussion of understanding how these implications that we, by focusing on the early childhood uh, areas, what kinds of things in the long term. Uh, we, we have the research. There's been uh, prizes given to researchers who have been able to demonstrate this, but we haven't been able to convince folks in, in these times to invest now for a 10, 20, 30 year uh, change down the line. So I don't think it's co finding common ground. It's finding, it, it, it's trying to f figure out how we can identify the importance of it. It's, it's important but not urgent. How do we change that? Um, I think perhaps um, taking a multi-generational approach that you can actually invest in child and families at the same time. And certainly Medicaid is one of our multi-generational approaches. Um, another place is looking at employers, big employers who are purchasers of health care. Uh, an investment in a child has an implication for the parents who are working there, but also a longer term if that employer is going to be in a certain area. So I think it's making sure that we have that argument that um, of, of where the invent, intervention early on can have longer term coming from not just those that are pediatric providers. Everyone has to say this is important and this needs to be an investment that we make now. I would agree. I think there is already common ground. I mean, there, I don't think there's anyone who's going to say we don't care about children. I think the real issue is whose children are they, right? So little black children in Detroit, are they as important as, you know, a, 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 a Caucasian child who's living in another area of the state? I would say absolutely they're both as important, but we have to really take a good look at ourselves and determine whose children we're talking about and bring that humanity to all of society, not just you know, thinking that those people are over the years so or it doesn't matter. So uh, again, I will um, move upstream, 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 and I think when we talk about multi-generational issue, one of the things we found in West Virginia, the reason we're seeing um, uh, sort of declines in teen pregnancy is just not access, but it, it is a multi-generational issue. It's those women who utilized um, contraception now they're mothers, and they've, they've, they've been able to pass that knowledge uh, onwards to their daughters and their sons. Um, so I, I do think that we have to move beyond uh, just to communities, to uh, antenatal times. I mean, again, uh, before a woman is pregnant, I think that's the time to prepare. That's then we get and end up at where children are. But I think part of that also is, um, you know, some of the work we're doing, like Birth to Three program and others where, um, we are using Medicaid as, as to support some of that. But on the other hand, the trauma-informed communities, the adverse childhood experiences and things like that that still need to be worked on, uh, again, from a multi-generation um, standpoint. I think some of the, the challenges that there is 
evidence in front of us all the time about profound injustice, particularly as it affects children. Um, you, know, you didn't have to look too far recently with some of the immigration policies to see one example of that, but there are many examples of that. And I, I would just say that the concept of how that becomes something that people see as a crisis that has to be dealt with now is uh, a very important issue for public health and taking advantage of opportunities for people to open people's eyes to things that may in fact be be right there i think is a really important opportunity for public health Go ahead. Uh, paul jarris independent consulting new um, the question about children it, it's very easy, interesting because it often starts at childbirth whereas we take a life cycle approach there's so much we need to be doing before that child is born um, and there's a lot of policy issues here. If we look at Medicaid in many places, it will boot, a, a woman becomes eligible when she becomes pregnant and gets booted off six weeks later, which basically the policy there is to treat women as a vessel for delivering babies with no concern for their health in the long run. It also means there's no concern for the prepartum period or the intrapartum period. And if we want healthy babies, we have to be taking a prepartum and intrapartum period. And there are things that can be done. South Carolina does now pay for group prenatal care, for example, one of the few states that pays for a very, an evidence-based model that others aren't paying for. We looked at, when I was with the March Dimes, congratulations, Ralph, um, the, um, we looked at Louisiana, where there are parts of Louisiana who have preterm birth rates as well as any other place in the country. There are parts of Louisiana that have preterm birth rates of 25. The worst country in the world is Malawi with a preterm birth rate of 18 so worse than the worst country. We matched that to where things like 17-hydroxyprogesterone were delivered and available for women with a history of preterm birth. Guess what the match was? The healthier the areas, the greater the chance they got the services. The sicker the areas, the less chance they got the services. Total mismatch. So there's a lot of policy right there. Also, we can be looking at it. where are people getting the care and how is our system designed to provide it to those in need. But Again, we get back to a private health care system that doesn't have a public health responsibility. Right. Well, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I'm going to, for the last question, take Paul's question a little bit differently. I mean, we could have days of meetings about so many different challenges that exist. Um, this panel is really about how we see our way through them. What do you do when it's your job to take on these, these issues, which are so real and yet maddeningly still present, you know? Um, as you think about the field of population health science, looking out the next five, 10 years, the practitioners, the researchers, um, you know, how do you think about um, the most promising areas uh, to, to, to start to chip away so that when we have another meeting on this topic, it's, it's about um, how things are changing and not how things are staying the same? Also, um, I think um, there's got to, uh, we're, I look at this from a framework standpoint. I mean, there are things that have to be done today because the ge next generation is at risk. So we're talking about 10% prematurity rate. That's, again, a half a million babies, literally, uh, that we have decided the day they're born about their future, how that, that's going to be. Um, same way goes with overdose deaths or NAS. Um, smoking in pregnancy, those things. So there are things that we are um, sort of, you know, giving people or, or the future generation a sentence on their life the moment they're born. And I think that is an urgent issue that, that we've got to figure out which are these population. And often enough, these are the same population that are victims of, of these disorders. And they live in our towns, in our cities, and particularly geographically some areas more than other areas. Second aspect is, is the long term and the medium term. And the medium term things are uh, that we have to figure out what to do with you know, the big picture issues uh, in our country that goes to the three buckets, um, the obesity and tobacco and, 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 and substance use slash mental health. And then long term is how do we turn those policy levers from the, the medicalization to more of a public health approach or population health approach that actually starts to change the way we think about this. I mean, this is gonna be a multi-generational issue. I don't think it's gonna be solved in our lifetimes, but we've got to put the, the pieces in now from a, both from research as well as from practice standpoint that happens, uh, starts to take shape. 
I think I would ask, um, as we're moving forward in these policies, to have a better understanding of total cost of care and over what period of time. So we talk a lot about total cost of care in health care, and it's a shared savings based on the total cost of care. And of course, what is meant almost always is the total cost of health care that's included. But if we start to look at what the total cost of care is in a broader circle, if we, we keep going out, one example um, is uh, a lot of ACOs are, uh, started to look at the importance of um, using Meals on Wheels to decrease social um, isolation and food deserts. And they started utilizing uh, Meals on Wheels, which was great because that wasn't in their bucket of total cost of care. So if we start to say, what is the total cost of care for kids? Does it include doing better in school? So understanding uh, that what we're doing as an intervention is not just in the, in the core, the smallest uh, smallest uh, in, internal circle there. And then also, of course, total cost of care and improvement over what period of time. If we continue to ask the question of saying, identify this intervention not just for the next 30, 60, 90 days, but what are the implications for the next five, six, 10 years? And you mentioned South Carolina. South Carolina is doing a randomized controlled trial with Family Nurse Partnership, and they are planning on studying the children for 21 years. And we need more and more of those studies to be able to look and understand those longer term implications. So total cost of care, I know over a, a longer period of time. I, I would agree with that, and I would also add that accountability. Um, I, again, speaking to those the, the silos that exist, I think that money needs to be withheld if those broader community health, population health outcomes are not changing. Uh, we all need to be held accountable, including myself at the Detroit Health Department. Take the money away. If we do a program in five years from now, it's not working and the population's health is not uh, improving. Some of my funders are in the room. They're, okay, John A., I'll come back to you about that. Uh, but, but I, the most viewed clip on YouTube. But, but, I, but I do think we have to be serious about accountability and not just evaluating our silo of programs and the incentives have to be aligned with accountability. Great. Well, please join me in thanking these fantastic health professionals.